Hi guys, it is a gorgeous day here in the end times in paradise down here in outside of East Bumblesock, New Mexico on this beautiful Thursday afternoon, November 16th, 2017. Now we're not in southern New Mexico, we're going to head to somewhere in northern California where it is my absolute honor and pleasure to bring to you the, 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 the poet laureate of the Dumasphere, uh, the one and only, and he needs no introduction, the one and only Derek Jensen. Derek Jensen, welcome to Humpty Dumpty Tribe. Well, thank you for having me. So, as I say, every, everyone, as I was just telling you, everyone knows uh, who, who Derek Jensen is uh, on this tribe. If, if you don't know who Derek Jensen is, then, uh, then obviously look it up. I just don't want to spend a whole, it would take me a full hour to go through the honors of, uh, uh, of introducing this man, one of, one of the, if, if not the single most important voice that is out there about what is going on on planet Earth. So we are going to dive right in and I, I mentioned to Derek I, I have just a few questions to build on but we're going to start Derek with probably you know the number one question on everybody's mind at this point where we are in November of 2017. It's something I had to it was I was asked this question just yesterday, and I need to get your opinion. Paper or plastic? Um. Uh, honestly, what I use is re is uh, my mom made some canvas bags twenty years ago, and I reuse those. I use those all the time, so I don't use either. So you remember to take them to the store with you? I just I, I leave them in the back of the car because uh, because I would forget. And yes, yeah, sometimes I do forget and leave them in the car when I get to the store, um, and then I have to go back out. But but um, and if it's a choice, if my only choices are paper or plastic, then I choose paper. But uh, reusable bags is is better. And then of course this is a great metaphor already for um, we can be concerned about paper or plastic, and that is something to be concerned about. But that doesn't alter the fact that you're going into a store and buying tomatoes out of South America in January, or you know, you're buying stuff that is. I just read the other day that 90% of the stuff that we buy has been transported on container ships, and so you're buying something from a long ways away, probably. So yes, there is the bag, and <laughs> in addition, there is the thing itself. And let's let's not pretend that if you use a canvas bag time and again that that actually makes it okay to buy some shit from China there you go. Quick, which is uh, my niece is uh, one of my nieces is married to a man from China and she lived over in China for several years and they came to visit a couple years ago and uh, I live in a small town and Walmart has has done what it does and driven everybody else out of business so uh, we had to get something, I don't know what, and we went over to Walmart, and as we're walking the store, my, my, my niece's husband is not a lefty. I mean, he's not, his, his politics, he's a very nice guy, but his politics are not, would not agree with yours or mine. Um, anyway, we get, to, we get to Walmart, and he stops, and then he says, you know, and he's probably 35, 40, and he, he says, uh, you know, when I was a kid, the skies in China were blue, and then they went to brown, and then they've gone to black, and it's all so we can make plastic crap for you over here in the United States. And he you know, obviously isn't all for that, but it's you know he, he's he is not a political person, and he understands that. Anyway, so that's 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 my my medium length answer to your question. All right. Well, you, you will start to figure out that sometimes I'm a little, I'm being a little bit ironic in my questions. Uh, you, you probably do not realize this, Derek, but you are the author of the, of the, 
the quote, the Humpty Dumpty tribe quote, that every single day with my going on 5,000 videos that what I do is hold up a sign, a four-word sign, which I think is a quote from Endgame. And you maybe you remember this, or maybe you do not remember the quote. And this is the quote, we are so fucked. Not just that we are fucked, we are so fucked, which I believe you wrote in. Do you remember where that four-word quote comes from? Was that from Endgame? Well, it's either from Endgame or from the Endgame talk. And in the Endgame talk, what, what I would one of the things I would do is I would talk about we are so fucked and life is really good. And um, well, talk and, about it. And it has to do with the well. Okay, so so it, it comes from the idea that a lot of I, I can't tell you how many times that I have been asked to write some sort of essay for some environmental magazine or something and they'll say we want you to write about the apocalypse and then they'll say and make sure to end on a happy note and there is this notion that we always have to uh, you know we, could, we, we can describe how bad things are well not really we can describe kind of how bad things are but then we always have to present these superficial solutions and you see this all the time you see this in, in the mainstream environmental movies. They, they drive me crazy. You'll have you know, Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth, and he has all these problems. He lays out what's going on with global warming, and then his solutions are inflate your tires, change your light bulbs, <laughs> stuff that is obviously insufficient to, the, to, to what's going on. And the same was true with Food, Inc. They went all through this long, very good discourse about how terrible the entire food production system is, and then one of their solutions is you're supposed to buy yogurt at Walmart from some. <laughs> like, that's, that's nuts. So we have this. I think it's actually really harmful to present these terrible circumstances, and then to provide solutions that are uh, are wrong and superficial. And and I think. That's not. It's, it's not helpful, and I think it actually creates more. Uh, I think it leads to inaction. I think it leads to a lack of resistance, because it can be. Uh, well, a, a couple of things. One is to to have these solutions that are so obviously lies presented to you, can can cause you to. To just distrust the entire the entire message, and to, it'll it'll cause a cognitive dissonance that is. Um, I mean, look at it. You're you're in Nazi Germany. You know how bad things are in Nazi Germany. Things are just, you know, there is repression all around. There is waging aggressive war, and somebody describes this to you, and then says, "Okay, and the way out of this is to compost." <laughs> and I was like, "What the, what the hell? This this would make no sense," and so. So, so, so then there's this idea that part of the reason that part of the part of the, the the place that comes from is this notion that if you understand, people have this great fear that if they understand how bad things are, that that means they have to walk around being miserable all the time, and that's not true. What we can do is start to get a, a handle on how bad things are. For me, at least, it's actually quite liberating, and to it. It frees me up to to act and to resist <clears throat> better because what I found was that I was spending more energy. And I, I notice a lot of people do this. They spend more energy trying to avoid realizing how bad things are than if we were to simply realize how bad things are. So it's, it's not so much the actual sorrow and pain that hurts as it is our resistance to it. Well, how and bad how bad are things? How bad are things? I, well, what is it? I just, just, just this morning read that 75% of flying insects yeah, yeah. populations have gone down by 75% in the last three decades. Yeah. And um, 
when you fuck with the insects, it's all over. And that, I mean, was it E.O. Wilson who said decades ago that if uh, humans disappeared, the world would go on quite well, but if beetles disappeared, everything would fall apart tomorrow? It sounds like something E.O. would have said. And that's really true. And, I mean, there are, almost every other day, I'm reading, literally probably once a week, I'm reading a new article about how there are stolid scientists who are saying the oceans could be devoid of fish within the next 30, 40 years. And that's one of the most extraordinary accomplishments of this culture. If you were to ask somebody 5,000 years ago, okay, one of the following two don't believe in it. A human will be on the moon or they will be able to, humans will be able to kill the oceans. They would have said, ah, they, they put a guy on the moon before they kill the oceans because the oceans are so huge and so, so fecund. Um, things are, um, I, I just, uh, I wrote uh, A Language Older Than Words uh, 20 years ago this year. I finished it up around this time of year, and we're, I'm putting out an uh, audio version of it, and I wrote a little introduction for it, or a little afterward for it, and one of the things I said was that whenever I think about that, the time I wrote that book, I wish that things were only as bad now as they were then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, I've lived where I live now for 20 years, 19 years, and in this time, I have seen, just in 19 years, bats have collapsed, a lot of spiders have collapsed. It's like at my mom's house, uh, my mom's 85, and, and I... Uh, you know, take care of her. Um, I carry in firewood for her and stuff like that. And uh, it used to be, even three or four years ago, that every time I take in a piece of wood, I'd have to search very carefully for insects and sow bugs, and I, you know, take them off yeah, and put yeah. them somewhere else in the in the firewood pile. And uh, now I don't even have to bother to look because there's almost never anybody there. And so even on those levels, things are collapsing. And then those of us who are who are older, um, I remember when I was a kid one time, uh, it was probably 1968 or something, uh, a friend of mine and I took this long walk through all these farmers' pastures, and we came across, you know, a lot of farms have little dumps where they dump their old tractors and stuff, and the farmer had dumped his into a pond, and so there's this really polluted pond. And the thing was still full of frogs. Yeah. You know, I hear from people all over the country that, that, you know, the frog populations are just collapsing. It's just, it's, it's dreadful everywhere. And, um, I, yeah, we're, we're, we're really fucked. And I don't, and, and, and in addition, the, the uh, any sort of meaningful resistance is not really on the horizon. You know, that's, that's it's less problem. on the horizon. I, I, I see it. I'm sorry. I see it less of a resistance almost now than I did uh, when I started doing what I when I pulled my own head out of my ass eight years ago. I see it being eroded. The resistance of anything. Yeah, I don't. I don't disagree. And you know, if we go further back, there's. You know, I still remember a time when a lot of environmentalism, at least, was about protecting wild places and wild beings. And there are some environmentalists who still do this, and there are some, even some organizations who still do this, and that's wonderful, and I have nothing but respect for them. But there, it, it's extraordinary how environmentalism has been co-opted from uh, saving wild places and saving wild beings to trying to sustain this culture a little bit longer um so environmentalism has become about quote sustainability which is not about sustaining wild places or wild beings it's about sustaining this culture it's it's completely nuts i mean the entire climate change movement is has been central to that and it's just dreadful that uh the all the so-called solutions that we see to global warming they all take industrial capitalism as a given and the natural world is having to conform to industrial capitalism. And that's insane, 
in that it's out of touch with physical reality and any way of life. I mean, it, we have to understand that the, that the real world is primary. That's something that all these people are forgetting, is that the... This premise eight or nine somewhere in there from Endgame, yeah. I think. Yeah, that, the, that, the, that without a real world, you don't have any social system whatsoever. And there, there are so many directions we could take this that it's this... I mean, I'm actually seeing articles in papers about how people want to, to build artificial glaciers to somehow make... <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's just, it's just nuts. All yeah, it is, yeah. Just, are just, and, you know, so much of the stuff with global warming, even global warming could be the, the capacity of forests and seagrasses and prairies to sequester carbon is extraordinary. That I still think that if we got, and there are some people who disagree with this, and that's fine, but I still think that if, if, we spent the money that is spent on trying to build solar factories. If we spent that money on instead rehabilitating prairies and seagrass beds and forests, that that would do a lot more good. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. What do you think? I'm sure you read the the second warning to humanity. Uh, a few days ago, instead of 1,700 scientists, it's now 15,000 scientists spelling it out there. We are one inch away from the brick wall if we don't pull our heads out of our asses. Did you read that, and do you have any, uh, do, do you agree with the assessment of the 15,000 scientists? Um, I agree that things are bad and they're getting worse every day. And I agree that um, I mean, I, the, the only hesitation is is the whole brick wall because obviously the passenger pigeons have already hit that. Yeah. And so the question is, who are we? You know, in terms of we we are going to hit the brick wall. I think that. I mean, yes, I obviously agree that things are bad and getting worse. And I, I mean, the thing I don't know is, is whether, and maybe you know the answer to this, how many of those scientists have given up on civilization, have, have, have shown civilization to be, to be the cause and are actually suggesting that we need to deindustrialize uh, but the word is decarbonize. You hear this damn word decarbonize, but you do not hear the word that we just take the carbon out of the industry and uh, all will be fine. I mean, a lot of them are saying that. What is your what is your response to the decarbonization to save the planet uh, argument? That if we just get fix that thing, fix that thing, uh, we can turn this right around. Is that, is that what do they mean by decarbonize? If all they mean, see, here's part of the problem. I'm writing a book right now called Bright Green Lines, and it's it's about how, how all this stuff with wind and solar is is really is part of that co-optation that we were talking about. That a great example of this is that you know you can get a million people to march on the cities of New York or streets of New York or or Paris or wherever, and if you ask those million people why they're marching they're saying we want to save the planet and if you ask them for tangible concrete goals they will say uh, we want you to give subsidies to the solar and wind industries mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's extraordinary basically what has happened is a movement to protect the planet has been co-opted into a lobbying arm for one arm of industrial capitalism and that's an extraordinary accomplishment and an accomplishment by who? By the manufacturers of solar panels and windmills? Yes, and, and by capitalism in general. That this is one of the things that capitalism excels at, is co-opting all movements for sanity into their opposite. And honestly, the, the land doesn't care 
whether it is mined for coal or mined for steel for windmills. <laughs> it doesn't matter. And it's still, this is just a way to uh, promote more destruction, frankly. There's, you know, they, there's that dreadful thing by Mark Jacobs in the plan, so-called, to... Uh, to put in windmills all over the country and supposedly run the entire country by wind. And it's it's completely absurd on every level. Oh, gosh, and now he's going to sue me probably. You know about that, right? <laughs> yes, uh, I, I have not... Uh... Uh, damn it. So basically, very quickly for your listeners, uh. Mark Jacobson put out this plan for how the, the, the country could supposedly, quote, decarbonize. It could go to, quote, renewable, end quote, energy, which is... Every word in there is, is, is we can argue about. But anyway, a bunch of scientists, the National Academy of Sciences, put out a paper uh, saying that his, his plan is just bunk. And instead of doing what scientists are supposed to do, which is now you have a battle of peer-reviewed papers and you, know, you argue over the, the facts, instead he's suing him for $10 million. <laughs> that's, that's not really how these things are supposed to work. Anyway... Um, the, if, if they put in all the windmills that he's talking about, this would require more, just for the United States, would require more iron than is mined all across the world in an entire year. And the copper for the transmission lines, no one's talking yeah. about the thousands of miles of yeah. copper. Yeah, it's, it's all... And, and then there's, there's the batteries to store it, and there yeah. is the, which are incredibly destructive. And also, it, it, simply, it simply won't work. I mean, for example, uh, the transportation network cannot work on wind. And right now, uh, you have a semi-tractor that will haul a 60,000-pound payload. It has about a range of about 600 miles. And... In order to have an equivalent range with lithium batteries, you would have to have 50,000 pounds of batteries, which means you only have a 10,000 pound payload, which means why are you bothering? And this is true for those, for all sorts of, the giant ships in the ocean which use bunker fuel, they're not gonna go on battery power. It's all, it's all these, are, these are pipe dreams, and not only pipe dreams, but they are wasting time we don't have, and they are also diverting our attention from the real problem. And then there's the real problem, which is all that does is continue to fuel. I mean, for God's sake, let's just back up. And what is gross national product? What gross national product is in this culture is a measure of how quickly you are cur- turning the living into the dead. Mm-hmm. That's what it is, is you're converting living forests into two-by-fours and living rivers into 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 hydroelectricity which you can sell and does the world i mean everything everything is breaks down very easily for me there's one question we have to ask which is where is your primary loyalty and if your primary loyalty is to the economic system then then ultimately that's not going to be helpful for the, the, the planet and if your primary loyalty is to the planet things become very clear if you ask do desert tortoises want more? They, they say that all these these big solar plants, solar factories out in the uh, solar energy facilitation, solar energy production facilities uh, out in the desert, for example, are saving the earth. You have this LA Times article saying destroying the desert to save the earth. And it's like, no, they're actually not saving the earth. What they're doing is they're producing electricity for industrial uses. That's not the same thing as saving the earth. And if you make your loyalty to the fireflies and ask, what do fireflies need? If you make your loyalty to the, uh, well, to go down to your region. You know, when I was a kid, my sister lived in New Mexico, and I went to visit her a couple couple summers, and there were uh, um, horned lizards, horned yeah. frogs. Oh, I've never seen lizards. a horned lizard in New Mexico in the short time I've been here, never laid eyes on one. They were everywhere. I mean, when I visited my sister, I would see easily three or four a day just out, yeah. you know, walking around e- easily. And I'm not even, that's, that's if you're just walking, you'll see them. That's not yeah. if you're looking for them. 
And, you know, we can name anybody we love, and they're getting completely hammered. And if you ask from their perspective, like, what do they want? They don't want, they don't actually give a shit whether it's fracking or a solar facility. It's going to be harmful to them. Mm. They don't want a road. They don't want any of that. What they want is for is to be left alone. They want to, be, to have habitat. And so, for me, the step is, how do you, not how do you, but once you make your loyalty to the natural world, what do you do? There you um, go. Well, let's go into this whole... Uh... Uh, I was when we hit 30 minutes and four minutes I was going to steer it but let's do it now I, we could sit here obviously Derek you and I I've been doing it for eight years you've been doing it for 20 uh, spending you know going through this laundry list of how fucked we are and, and the reasons for it but my my list of what the hell we're going to do about it is a lot shorter than, than what we need to do do something about so I want I always break this up into two is first as a species what are we going to do about how fucked we are and then the second part just as individuals coming into this knowledge how are we going to live out the rest of our lives without what I call going Michael Rupert and putting a damn bullet through our head so let's start with the human species how are we going to turn this freight train around at this point well the, the you ask, you've asked a couple different questions here. One of them is, what are we going to do about it? Or so what are we going to, as a species, we're going to do yes, it? Yes, what are we as a species going to do about it? Yes. That's not the same question as what are we as, what as, what should we as a species do okay, about Okay, let's it? break it up. What Okay, what should we do? Well, see, there, if, I were made, if I were made president or dictator or whatever, I actually, surprisingly enough, would not deindustrialize in one day. I would do it pretty quickly, <laughs> but I would. Um, there are a lot of things that we could do that would cause very little pain and very little pain to our lifestyle, even. And I would start to. I would start. I would start by transitioning those. So, for example, I would. I would recognize that capitalism is based on subsidies and. Basically, that's how you make money in capitalism, for the most part, mm -hmm. is by getting public subsidy. And so what I would do is I would change, for example, right now in the oceans, uh, all the world's commercial fishing fleets are subsidized to a value greater than their catch. It's just insane. So the first thing I would do is I would, uh, for example, change subsidies and instead pay either pay the fishermen to stay home or better pay some fishermen to go out and patrol the oceans to sink ships that are doing illegal fishing there you go brother i like that i like that action plan a solid act item agenda it's yes. never going to happen never going to happen and i would take i mean immediately I, I was very influenced in my in my teens i was i was raised fundamentalist christian and pretty right wing and even when i was 15 or something i remember writing a, uh, a, an essay for school about how the United States had, uh, had, had failed our brave allies in Vietnam and we needed to nuke the commies. I mean, so I, was, I, was, I, I come from a bad place there. But the point is, I was, I was conflicted at that point because I'd also read this little broadsheet that was just basically all the things that could have been done with the money that had been spent on the military since World War II. Yeah. And it was extraordinary. It's like, Free universities for every town over 10,000 people. You know, I don't remember what it was, but it was extraordinary. It was really shocking to me. And I also remember reading that the United States spent about a half a million dollars for every Vietnamese person they killed in Vietnam. And I was thinking, holy crap, I could be off. I could be off on the numbers. It was a huge amount of money. And the point is, I was thinking, even as this little right-wing person, it's like <laughs> this is this is a bad idea. What they should have done instead of spending a half a million dollars to kill each one in a country with a per capita income at the time of probably 50 bucks. Yeah. It's like, give each one of them $200. <laughs> it's like, better for everybody. And, or my point is that if I were made dictator, one of the first things I would do is, is uh, divert money away from the military toward rehabilitating prairies, toward rehabilitating, toward cleaning up messes. That's and so so they couldn't even complain on a job level because I would be making jobs. You know, we can talk about the wage economy another time. But I'm saying short term, 
that's what I would do is I would just I would just transition away from all those economies. I remember, but it's never going to happen. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and another thing I would do is I would like say, okay, no more golf courses. And in fact, I would just get rid of golf courses and I would get rid of uh, retractable stadium roofs. And I would do all these things that are just extraordinary. And I like sports. I like sports fine. But for God's sake, the planet's being killed and they have retractable stadium roofs. Are you kidding? And so I would do, do, get away, do away with all that. People, why do people have lawns? You know, I live in this beautiful, beautiful rainforest. And when people move in, this just happened the other day. Somebody moved into this neighborhood. They immediately cut all the trees and put in bluegrass. Oh, Jesus. Like, what the hell are you doing? Why did you move? If you want grass, move to a prairie. <laughs> it's just, so I would, I would, there's a lot of things like that I would, I would do. But of course, I'd be killed just for doing that. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, you're, just the golf courses would, would yeah, get you killed. But I just want to mention that municipal golf courses use, just as, use the same amount of water as municipal human beings. I mean, they're, they're tremendous waste. Okay, so there's all that. Oh, another thing I would do is that right now overpopulation is a huge problem, of course. And the I could solve it without draconian means at all very easily all you have to do right now more than half of the children who are born are not actively wanted they're not like let's have a child yeah 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 wow. and so all you have to do is over absolute reproductive freedom done deal the problem is that a you're running into the monotheistic male god religions so you're saying well, one more time repeat that uh d- d- all you have to do is take it from there one more is, time. Is give women absolute reproductive freedom. So if they don't want to have a baby, they don't have to have a baby. That's it. And make it so the patriarchs in various religions can't say, you know, they can't keep women from not having a baby if they don't want one. That's it. But the problem is it won't happen because A, we're facing the Abrahamic religions and patriarchy. Yeah. And B, you'll notice when they talk about overpopulation, it's how different the rhetoric is in industrialized nations and non-industrialized nations. Is when there's when there are a lot of babies being born in somewhere in some country in Africa, people in the industrialized nations freak out and go, "Oh my God, there's too many people on the planet," which there are. But when there are when the population starts to go down in countries like Russia or Japan, then they do things like make holidays, sex holidays, to send people home to have sex to have yeah, more babies. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's – capitalism also requires increasing population. So you're facing those things. So let's go let's, – what we should do is we should deindustrialize as quickly as possible. We should defend every wild place. There should not be – oh, it's very interesting. I wrote this, this list of demands a couple years ago that we demand that uh, limited liability corporations be done away with. We demand that um, every – that, that soil is the basis of terrestrial life, and so everybody who owns more than 100 acres, you have to get your soil tested every 10 years to make sure that it is healthier and deeper than it was 10 years ago. And if it's not, then they seize your land, and they, whoever they is. And <laughs> I wrote this, all these demands of, you know, we have to, right now, 25% of the rivers in the world don't reach the oceans. Yeah. And so there are, the, those dams need to be removed. The rivers need to reach, reach the oceans. So we would... I would institute programs like that. And whenever I talk about this, a lot of people go, yeah, it's a great idea. And then there are a few people go, you know that would destroy the economy, right? And it's like, yes, I do. And that's the point, is the economy is destroying the planet. And which which do you care more about? This gets back to the loyalty. What should we do? We should take down the economy. Well, we'll get there in a second. What are we going to do? I can do this in real, real quickly. We are not going to do shit. What we're going to do as, as, a, as a larger group as a, as a collective, is put our pedal ever more to the metal as we approach this brick wall. That's what we're going to do. Well, that's what we are doing, clearly. That's what we are doing, and, and that's we're... what we will continue to do. And you will get some people, the really daring people, will say, oh gosh, we shouldn't have this automobile rushing toward the brick wall at 100 miles an hour. It shouldn't be fueled by, gas, by, by gasoline. Instead, it should be battery powered. You're still <laughs> in a fucking car running at a fucking brick wall. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so so that's what we will what's what we'll will do. What we should do is voluntarily deindustrialize. We should relocalize. We're not gonna do that. So basically, those of us who care about I mean this was the whole point of Endgame 
is I would ask people, thousands of people, do you believe this culture will undergo a voluntary transformation to a sane, sustainable way of living? And nobody ever said yes. And so the next question is, if you don't believe it's going to undergo a voluntary transformation, what does that mean? And you care about life on the planet. What does that mean for your strategy and your tactics? And the answer is we don't know. And the reason we don't know is because we don't talk about it, which is what you're doing, which is great. We need to talk about it. And, you know, so many environmentalists, where I came to all this was so many environmentalists back in the 80s, 90s, just hanging on by our fingernails, just hoping and praying that this creature stays alive until civilization collapses. And that's what basically all of them, all of the ones I knew, all the grassroots ones I knew were doing. And the, and that's incredibly important work. It's like an environmentalist friend of mine, John Osborne, says that the reason he does his work is he wants to make sure that as things become increasingly chaotic, that some doors remain open. Mm. So if bull trout are still there in 10 years, they still may be there in 100, but if they're gone in 10 years, they're gone forever. So one of the things that needs to be done is to protect wild places and wild beings. That's incredibly important work. And rehabilitation, land rehabilitation is incredibly important work. And that doesn't alter the fact that we also need to get really serious and we need to understand this culture has been waging war in the natural world for the last 6,000 years and how do you, what we need to do is we need to start thinking like warriors and we need to start thinking like generals and we need to start thinking like members of the military understand that the way you win wars is by destroying your enemy's capacity to wage war. How did the Union win the Civil War? It didn't win the Civil War by Gettysburg and, and Perryville and all these other battles, sure, that was important. But the real reason they won the war is because they had an industrial capacity and the South didn't. And they were able to strangle it through the blockade. That's why Vicksburg, I was going to say Gettysburg and Vicksburg, but actually Vicksburg was really crucial because it cut off yeah. the entire western half of the Confederacy. How did the, how did the Allies win World War II? Well, A, the Russians certainly did a lot. And then in addition, bombing the hell out of the capacity of the, of Germany to wage war. I was, I'm just reading a novel right now that happens to be set in Romania, and they made a, a passing reference to the town of Plesti. I don't know how you pronounce it, P-L-O-E-S-T-I. And they said that how that got devastated in World War II. Why did it get devastated? They didn't mention this in the book, but I happen to know this, that uh, there's the big Plesti oil fields, and they were, that's why the Allies bombed the hell out of them. And so my point is that a way I put this for decades now is if space aliens came down from outer space and they were doing what this culture is doing, vacuuming the oceans, uh, changing the climate, and toxifying the air, and bathing the entire world in endocrine disruptors, murdering the planet, what would we do? We would know exactly what to do, which is we would have to go after their, their industrial, we would go after their capacity to wage war, we would go after their infrastructure. And so, this is, this is why I wrote Endgame, and then this is, this is why also that I'm part of Deep, Deep Green Resistance, is that we are, we need to understand that this culture is waging war on the planet, and if we are serious about stopping this culture, we need to start thinking seriously about how we are going to do it. What are the tactics? What are the strategies? What does and doesn't work? I mean, if we had the numbers, we could shut down this entire party tomorrow. You know, if we had, if completely nonviolently, if we had 50 million people who were all on the right side, we could shut down this party. It's like when the French had a big, it, it cracks me up. The French are so good at this that, that whenever there's any sort of social unrest, they don't simply sort of march in random places. There was a couple of years ago, there was major unrest in which they started blockading the oil terminals. And this, this, that's, that's much smarter than just a random place. We need to start working our way up the infrastructure, it's fine. I'm not complaining about anybody who blockades, who blocks themselves, like, outside of a timber sale. That's a fine That's a fine thing to do. I'm not saying anything bad about it. But in addition, we have to start working our way up the chain of supply. And we have to start really thinking... Okay, I'll tell you a quick story. This kind of cracks me up. But last spring, I was asked to go to the... to speak to the board of Patagonia. And... I have nothing but respect for Patagonia. They have they have done so much good work over the past many decades. They support all sorts of really great environmental initiatives. They're protecting all sorts of land. They are they are what I would want for the transition as we move away from industrialization. Let's move toward Patagonia first, toward the, the company first, 
and then second we'll we'll just deindustrialize altogether. And I think they would agree with all that. Anyway, so we're all we're all having a very good conversation all day long. And then the last question they asked was, so if if we gave you twenty million dollars right now, what would you do with it? And I said immediately, I would use it to build a militant resistance movement that aimed at taking down the industrial infrastructure. <laughs> What kind of and reaction was, did that get from the Patagonia oh, audience? Oh, so funny, because their, the, their corporate attorney was there, yeah. and she was great, too. I liked her. And she immediately said, we are not having this conversation. Oh, um, really? You got shut off, huh? No, no, no. It was all fine, because uh, yeah. then we continued to have the conversation for a couple minutes. But uh, it's, it's, that's what, what we should be doing is, what we should as a, as a collective be doing is voluntarily reducing this in a gradual and decent way. We are not doing so, which means those of us who care about the planet should be working toward stopping this addiction to consumption and to control over the natural world. And another way to put this is if Delta Smelt could take on human manifestation, how long would the pumps on the Sacramento River last? They would last less than 24 hours, yeah. I guarantee. Or let's take horned lizards. If horned lizards could take on human manifestation, what would they do? They would presumably clear out things that are making it so they can't live. Well, Sorry, I'm just, well, I don't want to get off on a side trip about horned lizards, but anyway, so I'll, I'll, I'll nip that in the butt. Anyway, it sounds, so let, let's use this as your segue into, obviously, the the... The, the, the ultimate question for every individual going down this rabbit hole, agreeing with every word you're saying, brother, as, as I do, cheering you on, what, what can anyone listening to you have this talk for the 10,000th time, what can they do? To, 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 you know, just for the rest of their lives without just getting, you know, depressed as hell and going Michael Rupert with all of this information. How, how do you deal with this shit from here on out? What's your well, advice? I think, I think often of something that, that a, a wonderful activist said to me 20 years ago. She said, uh, I gave, I gave this little mini talk at a conference and afterwards she came up to me and said uh, that sometimes she feels like the only things that keep her going are rage and sorrow. And that's okay. You know, it's like, just do the work. You know, it's, it's, it's ultimately based on love, but, but the important thing, the big distinction is not between those who think we need to bring it all down and those who don't. The big distinction between those who get off their butt and do something and those who don't. I, the smartest thing I ever did was when I was in my mid-20s. I wasn't doing anything. I was just horribly miserable about this. Culture's killing everything. I, I, it's all so big and I don't know where to start. And um, I started by realizing I wasn't paying enough for gasoline. That mm. I wasn't covering the social and economic costs. And so what I did is for every dollar I spent on gas, I would give a dollar to a local environmental organization. Mm. But I didn't have any money. I was very poor at the time. And so instead, I would pay myself five bucks an hour to do activism. So if I spend ten bucks on gas, that means I must do two hours of activism. Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so... One of the smartest things that I've ever heard came from my great-grandmother via my mother. And there's something my great-grandmother always said that my mother has always said to me, which is, inch by inch, life's a cinch, yard by yard, life's hard. And what that means is I don't write a book. I, 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 writing a book is too big and scary. Instead, I write a page. And then I write another page. I can do a page. I can do two pages. And then the next day, I do another page. And before you know it, I've got a book. Yeah. And so point is, how do we eat this monster one bite at a time? And so what I what I really want is for people to do something. I can't tell people what to do because I don't know what their skills are. So many people have said to me over the years, gosh, Derek, you know, you've written all these books. Why don't you quit writing books and become an organizer? And first off, I'm terribly disorganized. I can't organize my pen. And second, I'm very much an introvert and organized. Like, I know people who, like, Oh yeah, I've got it. I've got an afternoon free for fun. I'm going to go over and leaflet outside Walmart. Is it kidding? That's horrible. I would hate that. <laughs> and on the other hand, I have things I can do. So when people say, "What should we do?" I always give a excuse me. I always give them the same response, which is, "Well, first off, do something. Find what you love. The first question is, what do you love? 
whatever you love, it's under assault. Whether it's coho salmon, horned lizards we mentioned, whether it's democracy, whatever that means, whether it is women, whether it is... Um, it's like I've got this friend who runs a battered women used to run the battered women's program in the state of New York, and she's wonderful. She is absolutely dedicated to stopping men's violence against women. I would never say to her, "Stop working on that and start working on salmon." Yeah, you know, that's the yeah. thing about it being so messed up. And no matter where you look, there's great work to be done. You've done five thousand of these episodes. Five thousand, you said. I'm closing in on five thousand videos. So why don't I tell you, hey, stop doing what you're obviously love doing, what you're obviously good at what you obviously have an audience for, why don't you stop doing that and start instead doing something else? I mean, that's crazy. So People tell me that 10 times a day. I, I was a real estate broker for years. That's a real estate agent for years. They, they, all, all the time, right here on my own channel, people are telling, telling me, go back to selling real estate. So there you go. Uh, well, and for what it's worth, they do that to everybody. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, I became friends, 15 years ago, I became friends with Joan Baez. And one of the first questions I asked her is, so do people tell you what you're doing wrong? And she's like, all the time. Yeah. I mean, every show somebody comes up to her and says, you know, you shouldn't have done this. It's like, my God, she has been she has been successful at what she's doing since 1960. Anyway, so first off, what do you love? And and whatever you love, it's, it's under assault. And just start working to protect it. Yeah. And the second question is, what are your gifts? And... You know, I have a gift for writing, and I don't have a gift for, or, or like in DGR, there's this guy Norris who is deep green resistance. You're talking about, and you said yeah, deep green resistance. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's this guy in the organization Norris who is great in other ways, and then in addition, he is he is so knowledgeable about computers. And it's like I call him up. It's like Norris, what am I going to do? My computer's falling apart. He's really important to the organization. Yeah. We have a, oh yeah. Like, we have a couple of accountants who who are doing volunteer work for the organization. And I, I, I never thought about accountant work as important in, in terms of this, but so many small organizations need people to help with the accounting. It's just, so if you my point is, you have no excuse. Whatever your gifts are, they can be used. You know, 90% of the IRA never picked up weapons. Irish Republican Army never picked up weapons. 90% of the U.S. military, normally, it's true of any military, yeah. doesn't actually shoot in combat. A lot of people are truck drivers, they are mechanics, they are people peeling spuds, you know? It's like, you need, for anything to work, you need people doing all sorts of work. It's like, and, and so find what your gifts are. What are the largest, most pressing problems that you can have to solve using the gifts that are unique to you in all the universe? I mean, one of the reasons I write the stuff I do is because it's what I feel, and another reason that I write it is because I looked around and I saw that there was a hole in discourse, that a lot of the environmental stuff was really sort of just happy. And, you know, you, it's just you write about the apocalypse and on a happy note like we started with. And I realized that you know, there, there are some angry African-American writers and there are some angry uh, female writers and there are some angry American Indian writers justifiably in every case, and I wasn't seeing really strong, angry environmental writers. And if you're not going to get angry about the murder of the planet, what are you going to get angry about? <laughs> and so, so I saw a hole in discourse, and instead of simply complaining about it, I filled it. And that's something really important. If you see something that's wrong, just go try to fix it yourself. There you go. And then the, the, the third thing is um, to figure out what people get off on doing, because that's how you keep going in the face of all these horrors, is doing something that you actually enjoy doing in the first place. So I really enjoy writing, and so I I get off on writing. Even and though you're writing about the murder of a planet, you know, I mean, I enjoy talking about the murder of a planet, and but yeah, I wish we didn't. I wish we could spend our time talking about, you know, why the. University of Texas El Paso football team is so terrible. Um, that <laughs> more people are talking about that than the murder of yeah. the planet, of course. You understand yeah, that more than anybody does, Derek. Of course they are. But the point is that, like, I did one interview one time that was so fun because the guy interviewed me about being a writer. And, like, out of all the interviews I've ever done, it was really fun to just do one that was, gosh, what's my writing routine? And... 
my point is that, I mean, I don't want to do every one of those. That would be a complete waste of time. But my point is, I wish you and I didn't have to talk about the murder of the planet, of course. I wish instead we could talk about, gosh, what are we going to do about it? There's so many horned lizards that we have to, we, <laughs> we have to we step on them all the time. You know, it's like, I wish we could there talk about, about things different. But, but the fact is, this is the crisis we face. And this is the time into which we've been born. And this is, this is the calling which we have been given. And we need to, we need to carry it. We need to, I mean, there needs to be somebody who will carry the, uh, the ring to Mount Doom. And there are, but the thing is, it's not just one. We can't count on Frodo doing it. Each one of us has to carry our own part of this struggle. Yeah. And so the, the, getting back to the, the last point I was making is that one of the things that we need to do is to figure out what we get off on doing and what we, what we, what won't burn us out when we do because because it's it's where we live and it's how we how we so so what people need to do find what they love then they need to find what their gifts are and then people need to find what they really enjoy doing and then bring all those together get off their butts and actually do something and one reason that i i I moved from talking about taking down the industrial infrastructure to this place is when I, when, I went, when I went to the personal, is because I think it's really important that people, um, I don't in any way want to, to disrespect the work of those who are protecting specific wild places. That if that's what you're called to do, you know, so I, I know this one woman who has literally written the book on how to fight the California Department of Fire and Forestry. And she, uh, has argued before the state Supreme Court against timber interests. And I would never tell her that she needs to do something else because she's being incredibly effective. So that's the thing is find ways you can be effective. And and then we also need to, one of the parts of this is to have conversations like this one where we are also expanding the range of what is possible and what is thinkable. But that's one of the things I find extraordinary is it is thinkable. It is thinkable and speakable to talk about the death of the oceans. That is thinkable and speakable in this culture. What is not thinkable and speakable in this culture is stopping industrial civilization. For God's sake, what's his face? Um, oh, God, what's his name? Hawking. Stephen Hawking yeah. is saying the humans are going to go extinct, or that the, no, the planet could be uninhabitable within 500,000 years. Don't disagree with that. Don't disagree with that. But his solution is then go to Mars. Space? It's like, what the fuck are you talking about, dude? That's like saying, look, we're burning down our house. We're going to have to move. It's like, no, maybe stop setting your house on fire. Just a thought. So I think the conversations like you and I are having here are incredibly important because the realm of what is thinkable and speakable must shift. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Exactly. I've been trying to get at it for eight years and having limited success. Anyway, I, I see. I, I absolutely am, am loving this. I, I could sit here and yak for, uh, for for four hours, but we're at, we've got seven minutes before this camera shuts down. Uh, I, I don't know. Am I, do I dare go here? First, I, this this in the last few minutes, this is some word association. The, the the first word that comes to your mind: Donald Trump. Uh, typical. He is representative of the culture. Okay, and I, I the, the a, a perfectly good answer. Ant- What's that? How, this is this is precisely what we expect from a dying empire. You know, you see these you see these emperors in Rome that are just buffoons, and they are dangerous buffoons. And uh, and why are we surprised when a profoundly nature hating racist, misogynist culture uh, elect somebody who is profoundly nature-hating, racist, and misogynist. What a surprise. Yeah. Okay. And simply because a someone else I interviewed this week brought up your name, I'm just going to say these two words, and the answer is no comment is perfectly legitimate answer. Guy McPherson. Um, I prefer to talk about issues rather than people. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, just uh, 
that he brought up your name, so I was going to bring up his. That was the best answer I have heard at that word association in, uh, throughout the whole conversation. Well, we're down to less than five minutes. So, Derek Jensen, if you have a, a parting message to the, 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 anyone listening to this video, you have the floor for about uh, two and a half minutes here. What is your what is your takeaway message that you want to leave us with on your way out? Well, it says my friend Leo Keith often says, um, if there is anybody alive, if there's anybody left alive in a hundred years, they're going to wonder what the fuck was wrong with us that we didn't fight like hell when the world was going down. And and and, and that is and that is a a, a challenge I take it from, to start fighting like hell. Premise seven from Endgame, by the way, guys. Anyway, we need to, uh, as I say, uh, where can we go ahead and plug your various websites and, and whatnot in the, in the last minute here? Uh, where do we find more of you? Uh, DerekJensen.org, D-E-R-R-I-C-K, J-E-N-S-E-N.org. Um, there's Deep Green Resistance. You can look up their website, DeepGreenResistance.org, I believe. Uh, you can uh, uh, look for my books in libraries, and um, and thank you so much. Your questions are great. You're doing a great job. All right, and with that, guys, we are going to wrap up, and we want to send one huge thank you. It took me four years to get here, guys, and it was worth every minute of the wait. So uh, maybe I'll check back in in another. Maybe hopefully it won't be four years when we talk yeah, again. Just, Let's do it again way sooner in four years. All right, brother. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks so much.